literature and maybe we want to learn from you how to look for validation data. We want to learn from you as a science researcher where what can be the best way for somebody like people, like all the speakers that they, that, that they hear, we all talk about different points of view and mostly we try to follow the literature that is already there. And for holistic approaches, we have limitations, as you know. So how do you get, first of all, how do you get into this fascinating work to really dig deeper in science to find the validation that can be the first start and then we so, develop. So I'll, I'll try and give you the short version of this whole thing. First of all, I've always had this fascination with temporomandibular joint and pain. And I've gone through certain transitions in my lifetime uh, where I started off with someone like Harold Gelb uh, in very, very young in my career. And the way I was turned on to Harold Gelb was very simple. Uh, when I was in dental school, uh, my mother-in-law worked in a practice for a physician. Downstairs from that physician in the, in the basement level was an orthodontist, Richard Kaufman. We called him Dick. And um, he turned me on to Harold. He also introduced me, now I graduated dental school in 1977. I think I saw Mariano in New York in around 1980. So, you know, at that time, we didn't really know all that much. And, and then I started to get involved in pain. I figured, you know what? If I'm, if I'm treating people with pain, I might want to know something about it. And so I'm the person who goes out reads the book. Re remember the time frame. Internet is not really a big issue in those days. I didn't even have a computer. So you went out and bought textbooks. So I got myself two textbooks. One was by Bonica on the management of pain. That's a two volume job. And then I think even heavier, but not the same two volumes was Melzack and Wall. And I just read them cover to cover. So it was really very easy. But if you wanted to work in those days towards doing research and figuring things out, you were really putting all these books, big volume books out in front of you. Um, and you know, then I had some issues in my life. Well, after reading those books, I started to put together pain patterns. And then I came across a disease in those days, it was called reflex sympathetic dystrophy. And then I started working with anesthesiologists and, you know, that was the, maybe one of the best teaching lessons in my life because, you know, if you have a hammer and a nail, everything looks the same to you. And I was seeing that these patients met the criteria for that. As a matter of fact, when I brought it to the attention of the anesthesiologist, they looked at me like I was a queer duck and said, I don't believe it. And I said, I will bet you a steak dinner on this. And I was right. The problem was, is that after doing hundreds of these patients with Stella ganglion block, and if you look at the literature on this and the history, it dates back to the Civil War with Weir Mitchell. So you, you kind of look, and this guy never really maybe talked about the important things. As a matter of fact, his son said, even the treatment that he was doing, which was sympathectomy during the Civil War, wasn't working out all that well. And I found the same thing. We were banging away at doing stellate ganglion blocks of the sympathetic nervous system. And what was happening is that our patients weren't getting better beyond the course of the time that the anesthetic worked. So like, you know, I, I had a practice where everybody that would come into my office was crying. These people with such pain. And I said, you know, this is lousy. I'm not getting them any better. I feel like I feel like I'm an oncologist that can't do anything for anybody. What value is this? And so I split it. Now, in the midst of all this, I ended up going to NYU. And I was their director of neuropathic pain in their in their postgraduate TMD section. So Michael Gelb was there doing the TMJ, and I was trained by Peter Dawson. So now Dawson comes in. To this whole thing. So I transcend from, from Gelb into Dawson. Now, if you ask about important people in your life, I'm going to give Peter Dawson some really good kudos here. Because what he did for me 
was he challenged me. And you've heard these words, Hamid. I know you're gonna, I know you're gonna smile when I say them. He challenged me to be the physician of the stomatic not the cavity. That's what he did. Be that physician. So probably, and, and people don't know me here, probably I am the one who took him most liter literally on this. And so when I would go to Dawson's courses, I would go with my books. I had them in an attache case. They were, kind of, they were kind of like my parachute, okay? Because every time he said something, I had, I had the two-volume rheumatology textbook with me from the 1980s, Kelly, Sledge, Ruddy, and Harris. And I had read that cover to cover, and it was given to me by another important person in my life, Gary Meredith, who was a rheumatologist who practiced down the hall from me. And when I would start to ask him questions that I would pick up from Dawson and Piper, I would go to Gary, i say, does this sound right for you? Well, I, after asking him too many questions, you know, like, I, I feel like that person, Dara, you know, I'm the why guy. Why is this happening? And so then I started to look at this from a systemic perspective. And when I went back to Dawson and challenged him about it, I fell out of his graces. It, it became nasty. So I, I decided, you know what? I'm going to put this down for a little bit because I don't really feel comfortable. There are too many conflicting issues related to that. And they were telling me centric relation was an answer. And you know what? In 20% of the cases, I had big time problems, big time problems. At first, I thought I wasn't good enough for the technique. As it turns out, I was more than good enough. And that's why I bond so well and resonate so well with someone like Francesca, because Francesca, when she spoke, she talked about the power of listening and observation and then figuring things out. What do you do with this information when you reach a point of professional conflict in your life? So, so here's the big breakthrough that comes about. Okay, I have a, okay, go ahead. Go ahead, talk. So what is, uh, in that point, what we want to figure it out is how do you combine the science of a systemic approach in comparison with biomechanics or, you know, what you see in the patient that you will try to do something mechanically? How do you decide what goes first? Is, is that you're digging to see if it's an interdisciplinary connection or your first try to stabilize the page with mechanics? What is that process that tells you, okay, this is not working what I'm doing. Let me see what is the interrelation for another point of view. What goes okay, so, so, so first of all, let me, let me first clarify and qualify who it is that I see and what I do. Because okay. the patient that I want to see is the one that nobody can figure out what's wrong with and why nothing is working for them. They've seen on average 12, up, up to over 200 doctors. That seems like a, not a lot, but this is the course of a lifetime that some of these people are traveling all over the world to get answers for their problem. Some of them have had multiple surgeries. So wh when I'm screening a patient, okay, I don't want the one that's looking for treatment. I want the one that wants to know why. And they're going to be committed along with me on a journey to see what the systemic issues are. So I am triaging these people at the highest level. Now, what is triaging people at the highest level is? Okay, that triage starts, and I'm not seeing a younger age group. So, so you would consider the sweet spot to be 17 to 34. My average patient comes in starting at approximately 42, 43, but my sweet spot is between 55 and about as high as 82, maybe 83 or 84. So I'm dealing with a little bit of an older community. And don't you think for one second that these problems don't exist even stronger than in the younger community? except triaging at the highest level means hematologic malignancies come first or solid malignancies. And we don't think about that in this community. We go right away. We're like a beeline, okay, right to this paradigm that we learn. 
this is mostly a muscular disorder. And I will not argue with anybody that said the muscles hurt. They do hurt, okay? But the question is why? So what I do first is I take all the symptoms. Now I sent the two of you my questionnaire. My questionnaire puts systems together. And so when I listen to someone like you, Javier, talk, let me give you an example of putting systems together. So you're talking about somebody who comes in, they have a forward head posture. What is the relationship of bite to head posture? And then I hear some of the other people talking, well, my patient's got tingling of the fingers, okay? They've got obstructive sleep apnea. And only a very few of them, I think it was only Dara that I heard, but I haven't listened to everybody. Dara talked about the systemic influence. So in that patient, forward head posture, obstructive sleep apnea. Maybe it's somebody that's young. Maybe it's somebody that's a child. There are a lot of people here doing child care. Okay, what is that pattern in somebody who has allergy and asthma? Are we considering that first? Or are we going first to modify them on a dental orthodontic level before we even really take a look at what's behind this? What are the underpinnings that I can help this patient guide them in the right way? So when somebody comes to me, especially in that older community, the first thing that I'm going to tell them, you're going to end up in quicksand because the things that I'm looking for in earnest are things that are going to need to be looked at by the medical community and make sure nothing serious is wrong with you. And, and if you took a look at what my studies look like and how detailed they are, how I'm looking all over the place, multiple myeloma, the lymphomas, which you're not gonna pick up too easily in the blood, the paraneoplastic syndromes, which I can, which are um, tumors that develop remote site from where you actually have the pain. So the people who are coming in with joint problems and stuff, I'm looking for gammopathies, okay? And I'm all in the immune system. It's always about the immune system. So, I'm probably the only one in dentistry in the world who's doing this. When I send my stuff to the physicians, like, wow, where did you get this from? I have to actually sit down if it's not a hematologist and explain it to the average physician. Say they have funny. no clue. They have no clue. And let me tell somebody, somebody something else that's very important here, because somebody might attempt to do this. First of all, it's taken me 13 years to put this whole story together. The platform is actually young. I set in motion all the blood tests and everything that I do starting in April of 2013. If you tell a dental story to a physician, it's the kiss of death. They're going to run the other way on you if you don't bring the ball into their court the way they understand it. Before I will ever get on the phone with a physician, I want to know more than him. I want to know that I can hold my own in a conversation and say, okay, you think this, well, what about that? And what are we going to do about this in relation to that? And can you help me get to the next person in the link in the medical community? Because the hardest part is getting that conversion. You got to know so solidly where the people who do special things hang out. And you know what? Building that network is the most difficult task I've ever undertaken in my professional career. It is so hard. So I see the world very differently. Yeah, that's really amazing. So you've been following the interviews, so we know what we're all thinking about. And of course, you know that we've been focused in signs and symptoms, what we can see. But it's a lot of underneath situations, as you mentioned, that they have a good value. Uh, what can you tell that can be the more common uh, under, under layer situations, systemic, that can look like something that we treat biomechanically? What can be that they're, that we they're say? All. say? They're, all, they're all, okay. Um, I, I can't even begin to tell you. So, so let me, first off, set the tone for what I am going to tell you because 
I'm, I'm all over the place. Um, I can talk to you about evolution. I can talk to you about genomics. I can talk to you about epigenetics. I can talk to you about anthropology. I can talk to you about the sensory motor system. I have no problem. I'm verbal in all these things. And probably not. Yeah, but remember, we need to simplify for the audience. Because that's exactly remember, everything it. starts with, an, uh, with a motivation. To. So don't, I'm going to keep it Don't simple. make it a scare. Let them uh, no, no, but go I, I want and to tell start you enjoying it that everything that happens on an inflammatory level has a biomechanical component to it. So if you're, if you're talking about somebody who has inflammation of the joint, what someone who is into neuromuscular dentistry might attempt to do is to move that patient, and this is the only joint you can do this with, is to move that patient in a direction which makes them more comfortable. But what if you can't move them anywhere that's more comfortable? And, and what modalities I'm using? So, so if you ask me, I've got problems in all the areas of life, but they don't all look the same. So I have problems with asthma and allergy, all of the autoimmune diseases, Okay, and I've got it running into the, the cancers and, and the topic is huge. So I'm just gonna show you something and, and there's something that should be thrown on top of this. And that is the thing that nobody really talks about and, it, and should be out there. And I've been trying to do this so hard. We think the joint is sterile. It's not, it's packed with bugs when you get to this level. So, so it's really a problem. So. Here's a patient that I saw many years ago. I'm going to hold this up. Can you see it? Yeah. Okay. So now all the white stuff uh -huh. that you see in there, this is a what's called a T1 fat saturation post-contrast. So they inject a dye in there to see the inflammation. Now, I don't know if you can tell, but, but this is top-heavy in the si sinuses, and it goes right. All the, the way to the turbines, all the way to the joint, all the way all to the, the way into yeah. the joint. So if I look at this, and hopefully I moved it the wrong way. If you're a guy who works with a mirror, I got to tell you I'm pretty stupid. Uh, <laughs> but you take a look at the flow oh. patterns in this, and that joint is, is encompassed by the inflammation here. Where can I move that patient that makes them more comfortable? And she didn't give me much latitude on this case. She took away all the tools that I might normally use. And she was referred to me by the ENT. And guess where that problem resides? It's a sinus problem. Uh -huh. Yeah, It's a That's sinus fine. problem. So if you ask me, why does she have chronic sinusitis? So the questions I ask in my practice, the first thing that I want to know from, from the average person, I'm looking at the immune system hard. I want to know how many infections, I don't care where they are, how many infections do you get a year? Your genital infections, upper respiratory, sinus, sore throats, how many times a year? And, and the number is three. Once they start to get over three, then I know where I'm looking in my immune system. And this is the same thing that we're looking at today with the COVID-19. They're asking the question, have we developed immunity to this organism? So one of the things that I do is if I need to send somebody to an immunologist, I want them to do what's called a vaccine challenge. What they'll do is they'll take blood, right after the blood, they'll administer a Pneumovax 23. They'll bring them back six weeks later, and then they'll check the blood again to see what immunoglobulins you started out with. Did you retain your immunity against the organism? And then they know that you're predisposed. Now, if you are predisposed and you have an immune deficiency, then you've got some choices. Then you can go into IV immunoglobulins. Now, and that's immunoglobulin G. Now, if you take a look at that, I've got the same issue with the pain. Small fiber peripheral neuropathy runs huge in the TMJ community. 
So let me let me just give you a little prop on this so I can kind of take a look at what's going on. Here. Larry, since we want to be learning simultaneously, can you tell us uh, which test you normally we will recommend us to run uh, that you can advise everybody to say, okay, when you check in this, this is something that I found valuable and this is what you're going to be looking for. You're like, a we okay. learn something new that we can say. You got it. Yeah. Okay, so, start with so let, let's Monday. start with the MRI. I think that the MRI is underutilized in the TMD community. I think people are running to the CBCT. They can only see hard structures first. The MRI gives you soft tissue as well, and it's going to give you fluid. So the first thing that I want is when a patient comes in, I want a current MRI. And I want it done, if I can get it, with contrast. Okay, so I have a specific sequence. I can give you the sequencing that I use. There, there turns out to be a lot of pushback on this from the radiologic community because it's a longer sequence when you deliver contrast. And they want to turn that room over and make money. So that, that's a real issue. So I've, I, I've been having a struggle with them. They say they're going to give it to me, and then when they get there, sometimes they don't. Larry, but you don't think what is happening now is that we're taking advantage of the research we have handy? Like, if I remember, my first study with CDCT was about eight or nine years ago. And I remember that we, have, we didn't have equipment, so technically we, somebody came with a portable unit and we were tr trying to make research and it cost us a lot of money. So we couldn't do what we can do these days. Now, CVCT is a standard care. Pretty much everybody has a CVCT. And I think what we're trying to take is advantage to, to that. MRI is still something difficult to have, more expensive, cannot be in an office. Can, it, it creates limitations in your own workflows, I think. And can be amazing if we have these uh, MRI dynamics, for instance, that I show, but it's limitations in the world where they do it. So I think it's a, a big problem that MRI is, is, is just difficult. That's what I think people doesn't do it in regular ways. And, 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 here, and here's the advantage of the MRI. And I can do the same thing with a CT scan and get a medical grade CT scan, but it doesn't help give me the the amount of information I need because I can make a better diagnosis on some of the diseases with the MRI. Um, but you see what you're doing is a little bit different. What you're doing is you're using the CBC, you're then, you're then incorporating that, you're importing it into a workflow process that's superimposed on different bite dynamics. Okay, and, and that's not the purpose of what I do. My primary purpose, remember, is to make the diagnosis because then I can perhaps bring the patient to medical optimization, whatever that is. So we're using it for different things. And, and instead, what's going on, you're not making the same diagnos diagnosis I am. What you're doing is you're almost bypassing diagnosis. You're using your mechanical malfunction as a portion of your diagnosis. And then, and then there's an urgent move into treatment. How am I going to make this patient feel better? And then you incorporate into a relatively larger sphere of who's going to be on my team? What, what am I going to do to make this person feel better? And yeah, because saying, we based in mechanics, right? So that's why uh, we want to get something that we can learn and say, okay, this systematic approach. So you already talked about MRIs. For years, people have been describing the standard for TMJ is still MRIs, but it's still even that we know it is not something that we can go and do on Monday because that is not going to change. Now, besides that, what else? Which attempts you can recommend uh, that can become some kind of standard you say, okay, in my clinical exam, I'm going to make this blood test. I'm going to be looking for these values. And before I even do any biomechanical condition, these values need to satisfy 
my scientific thing because all, uh, the reason that we have you here is because we want to learn. We're students. We yeah. want to learn for you yeah. what is your expertise. Yeah. So, so for for example, okay, the number one autoimmune condition. I have in my practice, and, and, and probably in others, is validated pretty much in the literature, is autoimmune thyroiditis. So Hashimoto's disease is, is on the top of my list. And as a matter of fact, what I'm gonna show you in the presentation that I do, that it actually has a look on MRI or CT scan. And I'll show both of those and what they look like, that some of these diseases, you can categorize them. So when they come in and they tell me, you know what, I'm on an SSRI, I have anxiety, depression, and stress. Okay, the first thing I think of, my starting place, do you have a thyroid disorder? That's what I wanna know. Do you have stiffness in your joints? And then what I start to do is I'm starting off with Mount Rushmore and I start to chip away. What are the things that I got to chip away at? Because the differential diagnosis is not so simple. Almost everything has little subtleties to it. They look so much alike to me that it's very hard. And when patient comes in, what I'm going to tell you to start doing is the simple things. Women do not come in with nail polish into my office. I want pictures of their hands. I want to see what their fingernails look like. I want to see the colors of their nail beds. Okay. I want to do tests. And I have all these tests on video that I do. Very simple one that you could do. You can press on the finger. You can hold it for about 10 to 20 seconds. And then if the color doesn't come back in it, within six seconds, you know you have a problem. So, and it's, and it's perfusion. I also do Doppler in my office. So I do Doppler auscultation. Now the chances are pretty good is that your joint is gonna make noises. That's less important to me than hearing the vascular tone sounds. I wanna hear a good strong pulse. But oftentimes you'll hear whistling noises like breweries. So you'll hear b -b -b like that. B -b -b Sometimes you Are those sounds when the patient is opening and closing? What instructions do you have into the patient when you do this in Doppler? That was an old technique. Honestly, this is back in the days when I was with Gerber, he was still using Dopplers and I have I have them open. So so you'll hear that rush of blood flow come in when they when they open. But the thing that doesn't happen on some people is that you don't hear it. They're silent. And then you know that you have a problem. So, and I'll go all the way up to the superficial temporal artery. I'll try and pick up the facial artery. Not, you don't always get it all the time. Sometimes they're down a little bit deeper or in anomalous places where you expect. But I'm checking all the way around. I'm checking my blood vessels, okay? So I'll pick up the facial artery right in front of the masseter and I'll hold it there. And so you can see that there are inflammatory changes in the blood vessels. They'll tell you that the pain will go down their shoulder and arm like this, or it'll go up after that. So it starts out going down, which is typical, and then it goes up. So I know that I've got a problem in my vision. Larry, can you tell what it comes first? The systematic condition of the mechanical entrapment? You know, <clears throat> a lot the of systemic times, condition can be the result of the mechanical entrapment, right? It's a two-way street, Javier. You can't you can't separate chickens from eggs at that point. You keep them together. It's not about which comes first. You treat it together as a condition. That's the whole point. You, so if you're going to triage somebody, you do it together. Okay. How does this affect that? Is there something that's more important that needs to be related to that comes first on this whole thing? Things that'll kill you come first. That's the bottom line, all righty? And that's so, the most Larry, important. Larry, is it, is it fair to say then uh, you do want to address both? Uh, obviously, your, your focus is really finding the, the systemic issues, but uh, 
I know at some point in your career, you told me you, you did uh, uh, appliances. Uh, I did. Said as of two, 2009, you no longer do that. Um, Good do memory. You, uh, <laughs> do you uh, um, have, uh, do you work with another uh, uh, dentist that does that now? Or how do you take the mechanical uh, issues? I do not. From, I know? do not. As a, ma as a matter of fact, I'm pretty disappointed in, in my opinion, from my own personal perspective in splint therapy. And, and the reason is, is because number one is they were causing way too many anterior open bites if the patient wore it on a religious basis. And once they leave the office, you don't know what they're going to do because some of them are desperate for relief. And so they'll wear it more often than you tell them to. Um, and, and then there are some, of course, who don't wear it at all. So I had a trick that I used to do when I made the appliance. If you adjust all of the spots on the appliance, so you see little markings on that, I would take a pencil and I would put it for each tooth. I would mark where the contact was. And if they came back to me and they still had the pencil markings there, I know they didn't wear the appliance. Um, so a little trick that I used to use. But I couldn't predict who was going to get worse and who was going to get better. Under those circumstances, I opted out. And if you take a look at somebody like Domingo Martin's group, who, who's OBI Roth Williams, what you find is, is that they're recommending appliances 24 seven for a prolonged period of time. And before orthodontics is actually initiated, the formal part of the orthodontics, everybody walks away from there with a class two div one anterior open bite. And there are articles demonstrating that. Probably somebody who may be listening, if you take a look at the data on an article that was not intended for what I'm using for, is Solange Fantini out of Brazil. And she shows the vertical condylar displacements up to 9.7 millimeters in her raw data. 9.7 millimeters? Wow. 9.7. Wow. Where does that come from? What's going on over here? And, and, you know, I'm thankful for that study. And she's a lovely woman. She belongs to my group on Facebook. And I mean her absolutely no disservice. Everything that I have come to in my professional life comes about as a result of failure. I'm still failing. But in the hope that I can make some progress for some people, I continue to do this because it's hard, hard work. And mentally... How, uh, how is this um, clinical workflow, even though we're going to ask this, but I think this question needs to tie here, because um, how you do in this interdisciplinary treatment with your assessment that is really scientific based in systemic conditions with mechanical. Um, I, I don't. Come, can I come I, I to don't. the same? You don't, okay. I, I, I don't. I, I had to draw the line somewhere. And the people who were coming to me have already failed splint therapy. Okay. So I opt out of that right away at this point. So th there is no treatment, formal treatment by me in this group, in my practice. What I do for them, more likely than not, these are the people who have condylar resorption or severe pain things. If it's severe pain and it's not necessarily only the TM joint, I might be able to help them depending on what the condition is. So I make recommendations where they got to go to get their best bang for the buck. But if it's a condylar resorption case and they have a dental facial deformity, then there's going to be a discussion about whether or not they're a good candidate for surgery and what kind of surgery they should have. So I'm into the workflow in that particular direction. What can be done now in order to be able to handle your current condition? And if it can't be addressed, if there's no formal medical treatment for you, what can we do to protect you in your seeking a solution to get your bite back to normal, have comfort? So that's where I fit in. So I break the mold of everybody that's really here, okay, in, in what they do. 
I'm only seeing really well, one I wanted group. Here because yeah, that's what we want to see for different uh, objects. Exactly. Direction. Like you said at the beginning, uh, are we looking at different problems or are we looking at the same problem from different, different points? And uh, this is definitely a point of view that uh, we've totally, as dentists, we're not used to looking at, quite frankly. Yeah, and, and, and you know something? Some of the things that I saw from some of the other people that were talking were very interesting for me because it brought me back to my younger days. And I'll give you a clear example. Pete Dawson taught me that when you have a centric relation, centric occlusion discrepancy, that is a pathologic condition. That shouldn't exist, okay? As a matter of fact, nothing could be further from the truth. But if you're trying to make those kind of improvements with something that is relatively normal, if you take a look at Purcell's envelope of motion, you see that that actually exists. There should be a CO, CR discrepancy. Then am I trying to fix something that doesn't need to be fixed? And am I causing more problems? And what I found out is that yes, I am causing more problems, and that's the part of it I didn't like. I was critical of myself and what I was doing and the results I was getting. And that's why I made the move to see what was behind this in the people I didn't succeed on that I had trouble with. That's why I made that move. That's where I'm challenged. That's where my mind works the best. Uh, Larry, uh, I've been checking some of the articles that you've been uh, putting together in reference with uh, mandible distalization by reabsorption articles that you wrote with Dr. Arnett. And part of how you've been following the uh, process of regeneration of the TMJs after surgery. And if I'm correct, and correct me if I'm wrong, you published some articles with Dr. Arnett in reference with these matters. Um, so I was kind of looking for them, and then my question is, where do you think reabsorption will stop after, after uh, joint intervention? What is considered normal? Because honestly, I'm going to tell you something, in, in our own, own environment, we always try to stay away of medications because we into the holistic approach. Now, Alejandro yesterday was mentioned, and is what is described like a, uh, Arnett and Gunson pharmacologic protocol, where they use vitamin D, vitamin C, uh, uh, omega-3 oils, and they prepare the, everything to reduce the condylar reabsorption, and Arnett explained that really clear because he sensed it when the, the, the condyle has a swung as, as uh, we were talking yesterday. And then he talked, I mean, he has too much experience and part of what we learned from Arnett is he often talk about the mistakes he did and that's why he found solutions. And he said that this package of medication that is kind of holistic in some way, is going to help to help to compensate that reabsorption. Now, yeah. taking as a consideration biomechanics, because again, unfortunately, everything every of us we see for the eye that we train, right? I'm, I'm still even that I understand the influence of systematic, and then I believe you with my heart. I would prefer to have you in New York and call you, buddy. Can you give me some articles that I can read? Because yeah. I know what it takes. So, you know? so, so, so let me tell you something. Um, and um, I, I'm, I'm not hurt. First of all. Let me just say one thing. If you ask me about a person in the last almost 30 years who's had the biggest impact on my life as a professional, I will tell you it's Bill Arnett. And when I wrote that original article with him, there was somebody else who was really influential in my life, somebody who was really smart in dentistry, maybe lost one of its best um, ambassadors in Steve Milam, because Steve Milam had, if you think, if you think I know what I'm talking about, Steve Milam had a degree in everything, you know, he was just that brilliant. Um, and, you know, to tell you the truth, I don't think that that protocol offers me anything in terms of a solution, nor does taking a patient off the birth control pills. And there are plenty of other places that you can look. As a matter of fact, 
w one of the things that my platform actually sent set out to give me answers to was what causes condylar resorption. Because if you remember the word in front of it is idiopathic. It is not an idiopathic disease. It's not even close. Okay. My diagnostic rate is between 85 and 92%. And it's a heterogeneous group of disorders. And you ask me, well, what's going to work? Okay. And the point of the matter is, is that you've got to try and get the disease paired with potential treatments. One of the things you should have picked up from the lecture you heard on at the AOSF from me is that the phenotypes that exist here are enormous. And that's why they're doing genomic studies. Uh, but you can't get a genomic study from a joint unless you enter into the joint and take out the tissue. Okay. So biologics have a potential to work there. But you just can't say that you have a degenerative joint and you're going to get somebody on a biologic because celiac disease does not respond to biologics at the present time. Celiac is a big player. Some of the resorption comes from hypothyroidism in the Hashimoto's group. I don't have a Graves disease one yet. I hope to get one. But when you take a look at that, those are traditional thyroid medications. So you're looking to do things in a holistic way. You want me to give you something holistic? I'll give yes, you something please. holistic that really works terrific. Somebody comes into your office for the first time, says they've got pain, and I'm pointing right into my headphones, of course, but they tell you it's pain right behind the TM joint, okay, in between the external auditory meatus. They tell you that they can't close down that it hurts. They've had this somewhere between one and four weeks. It's the first time they ever have it. I'll give you the best advice I can. You throw them on a thousand milligrams of resveratrol for two days, then bump it up to 2000 for two weeks and see where you're at. You'll be shocked at the results. Okay. If after two weeks they haven't responded, I throw in an antibiotic kicker an antibiotic that'll kick it off. Usually, I'll use Bactrim DS on an adult, but Leviquin is Okay, a let's come back to that, because like that. this is deep and wide, but let's focus on this situation that you mentioned. So you're using this medication, you have a contention plan, and then you accelerate with medication. Why is that patient in pain in the first place? What can be which mechanoreceptor is the one that is triggering that that patient is feeling localized pain into the joint if it's not a mechanical condition that okay. is affecting the... the, the you, you, have, you have problems separating the relationship between what you consider to be a positional issue in biomechanics versus an inflammatory issue. That's where I come in. Almost everybody is an inflammatory condition under those circumstances. Even the literature about osteoarthritis has changed. They considered that to be a disease of loading and wear and tear. That has now changed as of 2013. So everything is being skewed towards what creates inflammation in the body. So you asked me what, so here I showed you a picture of a sinus that was infected that went right to the TM joint. What happens, what happens in allergy and asthma and mast cells? What are the populations of mast cells that are associated with osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis? You see, so you take a look at that culture and we're so honed in on the fact that a change in the position has caused our problem and yet you never really answer the question. What caused the change in the position? But, uh, but Harry, that, uh, that discussion, as you pointed out, of what really creates uh, inflammation in our body, this is such a deep and wide. I mean, we can go into our diet today. We can go into yeah. our breathing today. We can go and, into our... And, and you should. And you see, the problem is, the problem is the, the, right now, the tagline in medicine for where they'd like to go is individualized or personalized medicine. That doesn't exist yet. That's no. why they're doing these genomic studies because they want to get to the point where they can took a, take a look 
at an individual's genome in silico with their epigenetics, and then they can zoom in. Almost all the research right now is being collected in the microbiome area. Do you just put a patient on probiotics? Well, it doesn't work all the time because it's not customized to the dysbiosis of that system. This has become such a complicated problem. And to give you an idea, the number that you're looking at as the number of possible combinations, which comes out of the Human Immunome Project, that's part of the Human Vaccine Project at Vanderbilt University, James Crow, who's spearheading that, it's in the quadrillions, the number of combinations. So you're looking at something, and this is why the gap between myself and the rest of the community who is using mechanical methods mm -hmm. to reposition the jaw is so huge because I see the problem as, as being so difficult to address. I'm also going to point out that almost everything that I deal with is incurable. All the autoimmune diseases, all the malignancies, you know, all the vasculitis that I say, they're all incurable. Manageable? Maybe. That remains to be seen. So, so we come back to something similar to what happened with Alejandro. The type of patients that you guys are seeing are those cases that they, the more difficult cases eventually, the cases that you see the more degeneration, the patients that they already try biomechanical input, and you get in that little percentage. How you can standardize and say how many patients, how much percentage is systemic primary and what can be systemic as a result of a mechanical? Because part of what we're talking about, and I totally understand your point with what you showed, you have this patient with this uh, inflammation that is surrounding everything. I can tell you the pain that that patient ha can have need to be all over the face, uh, is yeah, breathing, is full pressure into the eye, full pressure into the ear. That is something that really put you, like also your sensors awake and say, okay, this is tough, right? But we're right. talking about patients that they can identify the source of pain by pointing, as uh, Rocabaro explained, and not just pointed, it's triggering the pain, like that pain patient that came, doctor, I have pain here, and they come in and are protrusive because it's the anterior compartment, superior compartment, the one that is inflamed. So this one, when the patient executes that movement, they kind of tell us, okay, this is what it is. And part of what we do with Rocabaro pain mapping is still a biomechanical thing that is trying to replace the MRIs by palpation in eight different segments. And then we kind of, by mechanics, say, okay, yes, this patient one is over protruding, is triggering that volume of inflammation and is creating pain. And then we develop a strategies from there to say, how are we going to make this fluid to go out? Let's put a pivot. Let's try to do some steroids if you want to go in a have, pharmacological have, way. Have, have you ever seen what it looks like when a joint has an effusion in there? Have you ever seen that on an arthroscopy? No. Okay, Remember, so, I'm new, brand new in gotcha. this environment so, of maxillofacial so, surgery so, and all this. So in, in trying to educate you, because, you know, what, what you're looking at and I'm looking at are two different worlds. And I, re I realize that. And that's what I love about you, okay? Because you're what I call Ecclesiastes. And I'm the same way, okay? A time for everything under the sun, everything has a purpose, okay? So here, you're looking, you're really looking at the same inflammation I am. You're just dealing with it differently, okay? Yeah. And what I'm looking to do is I'm looking to inject your area with information and saying, hey, we can do better. If I've got this effusion, I've got fluid in the joint, that fluid in the joint invariably is going to be accompanied by fibrotic tissue. Mm -hmm. And so, so one of the things you find out about fibrosis, where it comes from, infection, inflammation, coagulation come together. From coagulation, we get fibrosis in part. Now that tissue, that fibrotic tissue is growing. The disc displacement, I have a whole thing on YouTube about that, the real reason for disc displacement and its cause. 
I have that fibrotic tissue pushing out that disc as if it was a watermelon seed from where it's going. The muscles don't do that. And I address the muscles on YouTube also so people can see it. The problem is they, they think like you. What can I do to make this better? And so if I have an effusion in the joint that's anterior, and it's a big effusion or a little effusion, pain is a relative thing, I can't necessarily move them forward. And then, and then you talk to me about what, got, what can I do? So I'm gonna tell you what I did, and I have this on YouTube too. You talk about your failures, okay? I had a guy come in, it was in 2008, and I didn't know as much as I know now. It took me 2013 to figure out what his physician already had figured out and he didn't tell me. He comes in, he points the pain in exactly where you're telling me, exactly like you and Rockabato. I take a look, I make him an appliance, I do a spectacular job of getting this guy better. But his symptoms were all over the rest of his body. And I put those symptoms together. I said, in 2013, I think I can help you out over here. Well, what didn't he tell me that he should have told me in 2008? And I wouldn't have believed it or known how we dealt with it anyways. He had reactive arthritis. He had, he had the STD chlamydia. So here I got him better. Okay, and the rest of him is falling apart. So, you know, here's a situation where you're looking to fix the joint. But I would sooner forfeit that in favor of the holistic approach for the rest of the body. What do I do for that whole person, not just the joint? Does that help? I mean, this, is, uh, this is fascinating and scary, of course, because we try to know, because part of the it's input true. of the people yeah. that is seeing all these different views is saying, okay, but it's gonna be something simpler. And it's going to be something that is going to be taken as a consideration of the concept of the speakers here. And then we say, knowledge is everything, right? You want to know it as deep, you need to go and dig deeper. And it's not, it's not like... You, you do dig hard. deeper, but, but I want to make it really clear to you that there are still frustrations here, that because you find out an answer doesn't mean that's going to translate necessarily into an improved outcome and improved care. I wanna make that very clear to you because it doesn't necessarily work like that. And I think the transparency- You know what we need from you and people like you? We need something that is writing, that can be situations that they look alike to something else that can guide people like us that we more biomechanic to have a guide that then we say, okay, inflammation, be sure that you check into this. I did you, it can be a, an, a joint reabsorption that can be an arthritis. Do you send this exam? Are you taking as a consideration thyroids? So give us, let's try to, because time is, so let me move quick. Let me move quick, and I'm going to put you right in the zone that you want to be. A patient comes into my office. What I, I don't have a panoramic that's good enough. I want a really terrific digital one these days. So I'll send them for, or if they don't have it, a digital panoramic. I want to see. I would like to see the MRI and the CBCT. I like all those three things. From there, in advance of them coming in. They are going to have filled out my questionnaire so I can review it before they get there. And then I will break it up into different areas where I think I need to look. So I can't get the MRI before they come in because I have to see them to do that. And I have to get approval from their insurance company, but they're gonna pay 100%. So finances are not an issue once you get approval. And I do the same thing with the medic a medical grade CT scan if I need it. Their insurance is gonna pay for it. So that's a savings to the patient. From there, where I go is I go to my exam. Now on your exam, it's actually matched to what I expect to find in the MRI. But on my exam, I'm also picking up cues from the rest of the body. So not only am I looking at their hands, I'm looking at their eyes, I'm looking at their face. I wanna know if they've got any abnormalities on the skin. If it's a woman that comes in, hopefully she's with a friend or my assistant will be in the room or her husband will be in the room. 
I'm going to ask them if they can, do you have anything on your legs? Let me see. Okay. Do you have anything under your body like this, under your chest? Do me a favor. Go in the bathroom, take a cell phone picture of what you see very discreetly so I can take a look at it. So this way I'm bringing together different organ parts of the body and using that as an indicator for what I'm doing to help me find what the disease is. Now, the biggest thing is, of course, I run right down into my blood tests from my symptoms. So what I'm going to ask for, and I'm going to do this on the lecture, that I see, so you'll have something that's in, that you can look back at, Javier, is the first thing I want is a CBC metabolic panel. Those are the first two things that I want out of this whole thing. I never order a straight CBC. It's always with a differential. And then <coughs> from there, I want to look at my immune cells. And then I'll move down from there. Now, the, now the best part, which I'm going to show you on my video, is this. I talk about pattern recognition because it's taken me a long time to figure this out. If someone comes in with the condition and it hurts and it looks like this, my thinking was, you know what? An imaging study is supposed to help you make a diagnosis. Instead, we take a look at that imaging study and say, yeah, their joint is screwed up. I could have told you that from the exam. It hurts them. Okay. I know that. You know that. Now I can tell different diseases from that. So now if I do my MRI first, rather than taking a potluck approach on my blood test, I can pull up the pairings. So if a joint looks a certain way, I know to test for celiac disease, or I know to take a look for ankylosing spondylitis. I know to take a look for Crohn's disease. Okay. So, and a lot of these problems, almost all of them, they are extra articular in origin. Okay. I'm, I'm anywhere between a pituitary tumor and adrenal cancer, lung cancer. Okay. Anything goes in this category. You just got to know what you're looking for and what some of the symptoms are. So I'm going to do the hard tissue on the lecture for you. So, you know, if, if that helps you, and I know how abstract I am for everybody here, believe me, th and thank everybody for listening, because I'm not easy to listen to. Sometimes. We just need to get more, more often uh, education and information as people yes. as you, because it's, it's a different angle. I mean, pretty much all yeah. the speakers we have in common that we think believe in biomechanics. That's our main source of, of treatment or that's how we think. We're trying to look for compensations, weak patterns, and we're trying to develop mandibular trajectories that somehow facilitate the gliding of the surface and try to keep the muscles in balance, right? Right, right. But, you but, but, but you also know, and Hamid knows this, that you have that group of patients that are just refractory to that kind of treatment. Correct. I was going to say there are, there are uh, things that we... Uh, we know for a fact. For instance, um, are, are you checking for uh, cortisol levels, Doc? I do not check for cortisol levels all the time, okay? And that's going to fall. I, I can do that, and I have checked for them. Um, it's difficult. I know it's difficult to catch. It's not that hard. Time. I just ordered the blood test. It's easy. No, no, but the thing is at different times of the day, it's, it's uh, uh, correct. It's known to be different. And um, but for instance, now that we have all this big talk in, uh, in dentistry about airway, we know that most people, uh, probably plus 70% plus have upper airway resistance. And, uh, for many years that we've been just saying apnea, 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 you know, apnea really is, a uh, uh, is not the, the thing that we need to worry about. That's, that's kind of end stage disease of the upper uh, airway uh, resistance syndrome. Uh, but we all have, all these patients produce a lot of cortisol. And we know cortisol creates a global inflammatory disease in the whole body. It's an inflammatory molecule. So um, I, I do act, see act, Actually, it's interesting because you're taking an anti-inflammatory cortisone and, and you're calling it inflammatory. So no, no, cortisol. It's still, cortisol. It's, still, it's, it, it's, yeah. it, it's still working in that capacity. So... Right. You know, it, it, it's interesting how we talk about different things and different things, and you find that they are bimodal. So that's, that's what's going on over here. 
remember, one of the things that I can tell you, if you ever go down this path, there's always a cause for something, and then there is a counterbalance. You cannot look for the cause without the counterbalance, okay? And if you realize that, okay, that's where your blood test results will come from. So, you know, so like in Addison's or Cushing's disease, they're checking for the cortisol levels, okay? And you find them in a lot of autoimmune conditions. As a matter of fact, they look either Cushingoid or like they have Addison's disease sometimes, and they don't, and you can check those levels. But I've been almost everywhere with my blood tests, you know, so cortisol, yeah, but not the most frequent thing on my list, for sure. I see. Okay. All right, very well. well what, um, should we jump into the question, uh, Tom? Yes, think, because uh, we can be uh, with Larry forever. I know, you know I, I already happened to me. And, and you know something? I think it would be, it's better with me if it's actually visual. Because until you put something in a workflow process and, and you know, to teach them how to do it and why I do it, it's almost impossible to get this message across that, and it's important so that they can start to introduce us. And I started off very slowly. I was tiptoeing through the tulips till I got to this point. Long time, go ahead, shoot. Well, I had sent the question and, and you wrote a poem for me. Well, uh, I certainly wrote something, so I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna bring it up. So okay. You, so, so, so you asked me, and I have my computer screen up now, so um, I can't see you, but, but you asked me, what is occlusion? That's right. And, and, and this is what I wrote. A miracle of nature, the human joy is a wizard of diversity, standing at the crossroads of system network interactions. Its mastery is conferred by servitude to supreme functions. As the royal jewel of joints, the TM joint dances to the tune of many suitors, embodying the rhythmic grace of a prima ballerina in her dynamic, fluid, discriminative movements. She tells a story of secrets and whispers, beauty and love, joy, sadness, and anger. Guardian of inspiration in moments of need, she takes time to nourish the body and soul, and at the highest mode of human expression, she gathers cues from her minions and magically converts their utterances into organized neuromuscular goals. Far from static, she takes pause in the intimacy of her teeth. She swallows. And in moments of ultimate control as ruler of her household under varying functional demands, she is both the songbird and the pillar of stability. Lest she falters, she is the quintessential smith of the hammer and anvil, speaker of the house, bosom of suckling, mother of sleep, and dream keeper of thoughtless comfort. Awaiting the glass slipper, in recognition of her virtues, she retreats into the misty, mysterious entreat of morning's arms. My God, I, this is I, gorgeous. I think, I think this I, is the I more told, romantic, <laughs> deep, profound. I, I told you it's a poetry. Um, I, I think uh, I speak for everyone that this, this answer for what is occlusion definitely wins the wins the prize. Okay, like, so, I don't think so yeah. anybody will. Let, me, let me tell you what I think really about occlusion. If I have a patient that comes in and they have thoughtless comfort, I don't care how many contacts they have. I don't care how, how you classify their malocclusion. If that patient is comfortable and they can function normally, I'm done unless they want me to do something. That's the way I look at it. Okay? So, there's, there's the answer. All right, so uh, uh, in, the, in, in the second question, when we ask um, what factors do you consider prior to stabilization, your main objective and main goal and that, that criteria that you look at are for systemic disease. Correct. Am I that's, correct? That, that's correct. Where we can wait for you to make some kind of compendium about the more related uh, situations. I mean, yeah. we need to be realistic to, it, until osmosis doesn't work or like uh, we can have a software that we can 
just plug in here and get you, all you that know, knowledge so that you have? First off, let me tell you, I had spoken to Miguel last time I was at the AOSF. Mm -hmm. And I spoke with him a couple of times. He said he was going to get back to me. I tried to explain to him what I was doing. But this really needs a software solution. It's almost like I need IBM Watson so that if you plug this thing in and a person comes in with this cluster of symptoms, it can pump out what you're looking for. Yeah. Okay. In, in, in a re and, and that's what they're doing with artificial intelligence these Correct. days. Um, Watson is the best physician already. Yeah, that's it. So writing a compendium, you know what? I think reading about this is still hard. You, you know how crazy I am. I have, I have a reference manager. I have almost 25,000 articles in it. I'm crazy. I know. Yeah. That's why you're here. Believe yeah. me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so, so, you know, writing something. But, you know, Javier, I have an article out there from 2014. It's November and December issue from uh, Dentistry Today. And that'll bring people a little bit closer um, to where I was at that intermediate point, uh, you know, which is really taken almost from 2013 to write a 2014 article. Um, and, and I'm way down the road now, um, for sure. Um, so, Okay, so question number three, I think you've answered that. Uh, and this is which kind of uh, diagnostic information do you uh, take? I think you mentioned panel, CBCT, MRI, and then very very to the far, uh, blood, test. blood test yeah yeah a, a ton of blood tests a ton of blood tests um unless i can really pare it down um gotcha. so you know that's that's where i'm at with that and uh in terms of instrumentation uh you're uh, are you using anything you said even for cbct and mri you use outside sources even for yeah a i use I, I i use a doppler um, sometimes some interesting stuff that I can do is to take out a caliper. Okay. And you know, it has a center screw in it and on the two bottoms where you stick the point in the paper, if you were going to make a circle, I take out the pencil and the point I put in round toothpicks and I, I calibrate it down to about two or three millimeters. And you can actually do two point discrimination of the tongue to see what deficits they have in the sensory system. I use this predominantly for anterior open bite patients because they're a very interesting group of people with, where they've lost some of their sensory ability. So um, I do it with that, but you can do it on any patient that appears to come in and have a sensory disability. You could do it on the skin. Okay, they even have professional looking ones where you can get it from that the neurosurgeons and neurologists order uh, where, where they're actually pinwheels and they have the two points calibrated in advance for you, but it's sharp. Fantastic. Um, all right, so uh, uh, going to uh, uh, question number five, uh, asking about the interdisciplinary approach. Uh, who do you work with now? Are you mainly referring to physicians from, from your office? Yeah, here's how, here's how the flow will, will traditionally go in my office. I, I would say, and I, I run in streaks, but hematology seems, seems to be first, rheumatology, um, neurology, and immunology come down after that. And, and then, you know, it's, it's a sprint for, you know, the other um, medical specialties as, as to where I will end up. Um, I could be almost anywhere if I find the right stuff. Um, but sometimes infectious disease, sometimes urology, depending on the problem that you find. Um, and, and you know what? you got to pick good people. That's the most important thing. And they've got to be thorough on your patient's behalf, because I don't want to be, have to go to sleep at night worrying that I didn't do the best I could. That, that's important to me. Of course, of course. Very well. Um, I, I, I think uh, the next question really, the next two really don't apply, which ask about uh, posture, video, and, and things of that nature. You're not really um, changing or altering any vertical dimension you're you're really focusing or, or facial aesthetics those two 
um, you, you're really focusing on internal and systemic diseases. That that that's correct. But you know, you know, I don't earn my money like that. I'm a I'm a regular dentist. I see. Ninety percent of the time. So you know, there 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 are times when I do that, and there are times when I will take a face bow and I will take bite records, and I will decide, you know, um, how I'm going to organize my case on a, on a DNR articulator. So I mean, I'm trained like that. I can do all those things. Um, I, I have changed vertical dimension in some cases. You know, integral of space is an issue. Um, certainly. You know, all those are interesting things. Okay, so. let's talk about that, Doc, because that's an important thing from, since you come from a completely different, in a case like that, how do you uh, assess and, and decide how to open that vertical dimension? Well, f first off, I'm assuming it's not a joint patient. That's for sure. Um, but, but I assess that at giving the minimal amount of opening that I will need for my interocclusal clearance. That's how it's done. Uh, if you ask me where I would prefer they be, um, I will tell you that I will use a hinge axis reference position um, that is generally habitual, habitual to that vertical dimension. I will have the case waxed up. Either I'll do that or my lab technician will do that. I then will come back and I will index that in silicone putty and I will take that to the patient's mouth and I will do a try in assuming it's a full mouth rehabilitation. So I'm actually trying in what the temps will ultimately look like in their final restoration. And if it'll Let be possible. Let me ask you this, Ari. Yes? We talked multiple times about uh, you and I about is a rotation, is a translation, is a hinge that exists. What in this point you saying and you use the word that you will bring to create a hinge? If we already went over articles and everything that we kind of question, because again, the only objective, and I don't want to come to, 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 to this, does I have no negative connotation. I'm just curious. How you connecting an access point now with the open mind and the science that you that you handle that like all these articles that we were talking about condylar I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm going to surprise you with my answer. Okay? okay, the hinge is not in the RTM joint. The hinge is on the articulator. Okay. That's why it's called a hinge axis reference position in my mind. I don't really give a shit to be quite honest with you whether or not okay. it's a hinge. Okay, or it translates. I don't really care. At some point, I got to find a position if I'm rebuilding somebody's bike where they come together. Okay, okay. okay. I'm also less concerned with how they open because the average person is going to come in, they're just going to open up vertically, they're not going to have any lateral excursions. So, so for example, and maybe I should make mention of this. Uh, a lecture like Ben Sutter, who's talking about disclusion timing reduction, okay? I don't know anybody that opens up in a lateral excursion coming off their teeth. Unless they've got some sort of power function, they don't do that. But I think what he is changing is the inclusion timing. So when they're closing and they're working off of a bite, and you're talking about maybe in a normal situation, a teardrop pattern, and they're coming in from one side, he is changing the parameters by which they occlude. And, and, and the way they actually taxi into that occlusion. So I think of it as inclusion timing changing. That's what I think about that. I told you we would find common ground, Javier. <laughs> no, 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 I know, and I know, but the thing is, honestly, we've been, in the last two or three weeks, we've been going over articles, and, 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 you and, and let I. Me, let, let me also say something um, like this. First of all, of all the speakers that I've heard, and I haven't heard even close to all of them, when I heard Francesca, and she's talking about her dynamic occlusal equilibration, I just wanted to get up and cheer, okay? Because I have my patience. If I have to do this, and it's brutal for me at my age with my back and my neck and all this, 
in an upright position, bring in your baggies of the stuff you like to eat. And then we'll talk about how we're going to come down with different types of articulating paper. And we're going to see if we can refine your occlusion so that I can bring you to the comfort level. So wh when you're talking about what do you do biomechanically, I'm actually knowledgeable about changing the trajectories about what I'm doing to improve contacts, okay? And how, how that joint is going to have a representation of the brain and that's going to change from what I do for the patient. So, and there comes in your posture with all your reflexes and everything like that. So, you know, I'm in, I'm in your court. I just, I just have this added agenda yes. for other people. Perfect. We just viewed it. Let's go we love to it. the question number eight, which uh, we spoke about uh, earlier. This is going to take a, this is valuable. This, we want to really hear what he wants to say. So guys, be ready. Take a medication because what you're going to hear is not what you're expecting to hear. <laughs> All righty. Well, well, All right. Growth it. factors and the joint. Growth let's, let's open that can of uh, here, here, here's, chocolate. Here's what I came up with for you. You need to know the conditions that the patient doesn't have before you, before you embark on this because you're going to run across somebody who will. And I, I'm going to predict the numbers of where a percentage of complications, and I'm going to predict it somewhere between 1% and 4%. And I'm you know pretty bad. Not bad. We're not only bad. going to kill 1 to 4. Okay, but, but understand that it may rise a little bit because the people you're looking to do this for are certainly going to have more difficulties because they probably didn't do well in the other category. So I'm going to give you some of the big guns in here. First thing you got to run is a CBC with a differential. You want to see what your platelet account is. You want to see what your mean platelet volume is. And if they're low on the platelets and they have thrombocytopenia, which probably would be more common than thrombocytosis, elevated number, then you're going to have to start looking for diseases. So here are your big guns. Comes back to me, Hashimoto's disease. And I'll show you on my video how I check for Hashimoto's. Celiac disease. Evans syndrome, which is hemolytic anemia. Antiphospholipid syndrome. Is everybody taking notes? We are. <laughs> what was the last one? Okay. Antiphosphate. Then, then, then anti, do me a favor, go APS and I'll give you the stuff later, okay? Okay, okay. APS. Yep. Lupus. Then you come to your other thyroid disorders. Now it doesn't stop there because there are increased platelet particles in rheumatoid arthritis joints. Now you got to understand what you're dealing with here, okay? If you're looking at growth factors, in your mind, what was the number one growth factor you were looking at? Oh, there's so many of them, but- Serotonin? Probably the growth factors that are available in there? Yeah. Probably the chondroitin and the, and the, the one for connective tissue and- The chondroitin isn't gonna help you here. There's no way to resynthesize that de novo. So you're, you're relying on other factors in there. Serotonin is a bone regulator among a neurotransmitter, but in a lot of the categories that you're looking for, okay, there's, there's bowel disease bowel. that's associated with that. And so you're going to have malabsorption. Now, 90% of your serotonin, I'm just taking, and you should take a look at what serotonin does. Go to Wikipedia. It's good. Okay. Serotonin is produced by the endochromin cells in the gut but almost, that's 90%, 99.9% of the serotonin is carried by platelets. There is a difference between serotonin that's synthesized in the periphery as opposed to that in the brain. That in the periphery has a negative effect on bone. Dozie's article, 2010. So, and, and there are a whole list of diseases on this article that can create problems with platelets. And that's what you want to sort out. There are three pages 
that I did this for you. Here, here it is. One, two, and this one goes all the way down. And then and the last one only partially. And I'll send you the article so that yeah. you can read it. But 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 that's where you're at. You've got to look around a little bit in order to make sure that when you inject this thing, it's not going to cause a disaster. Allergies to this are another issue occasionally. And the other thing you got to know is platelets belong to the innate immune system. They will attack organisms, particularly intracellular. And you do have organisms in your joint. And I've got most of the articles that demonstrate that. That was one of the first things I did when I came up with my platform. And it's not so easy. You can't treat them with antibiotics all that well unless you catch them early because they'll exist in biofilms. Wow, this is fascinating. Uh, I feel again like the first time that I walk into the uh, Arnett's group class and then you see everybody talking about top of the head and the first time you feel like a, you don't know anything. This is a good feeling that makes us alive, awake. We want Absolutely. more. Absolutely. Beautiful. That's it. Okay. Um, you have one more question? Yes, we have uh, question number nine. Um, are, you, are you taking note of uh, uh, posture? Uh, during your examination. I know you mentioned that you're looking at certainly, but you're looking at it from the systemic point of That's view. That's correct. I, I, I look at posture with a systemic eye. However, let me say that I also look at it from a mechanical standpoint, but not necessarily what you would think. So uh, Javier knows this. You don't know this, Hamid. Um, yeah. I had surgery January 20th for my cervical spine. Okay, C3 to C6. Oh. And um, you start to realize I had cervical myelopathy with long track symptoms, so it was affecting the way I was walking and stuff. Uh, and uh, certainly you start to think about the forward head posture. How long has this been going on? Because I waited way too long to address this because I could trace this back probably to 1995. But you know what? It was, it was going slow until all of a sudden it wasn't going slow anymore. But I do have obstructive sleep apnea. I do wear a CPAP, you know, and when you talk about forward head posture and you talk about tingling in your hands and things like that, it's important to get an evaluation of your neck so that you know what's going on. A lot of these things, dentists may take on a little bit too much. And, and maybe, maybe I'm an example of that. Maybe I'm the perfect example of that. Um, but I think we need to keep a global perspective of what the physicians are there for. And I have a transdisciplinary approach. Dara has a transdisciplinary approach. I like what Dara does, okay? Everybody's trying their best to get a handle on this and to do the best they can. You can't ask for more than that. What I ask is, don't do any harm. So before I put my hands on somebody, my agenda is figure it out first and then see where you go from there. That's where I'm at at this Sounds point fair. in my career. One more? Question 10. Um, we're talking about the introduction of these ideas into our educational system. When do you think it should be. Do you think it's a good idea? Do you think it will ever happen? Uh, these are some profound uh, um, subjects that you, you brought on, extremely uh, medical in nature. Uh, do you think this is the right thing to be taught to dental students at some point in the school? You know, thinking back to when I was a dental student, I think dental students have far more on their plate because they're, they're getting the basic sciences within the first two years, even though I was an experimental three-year program at NYU. Um, and, and then they've got to do the clinical didactic. And you know what? I think that's really hard because, you know, I was up studying almost every night till the wee hours of the morning. And I think it's a lot for a dental student to take in 
and to understand how you're going to use this in a modular way to apply it to what you do. And, and if the impetus of dental school is to train you how to fix teeth in the supporting structures, then, then how do you fit this in to right. the model? And the only place to place it is to build a medical model on top of that. I see this maybe as a additional residency, maybe two or three years. I like some of the modeling, for example, oral medicine at the University of Penn, which exposes them to the medical disciplines and, and diseases that affect the oral cavity. I like how that model is built, but I think that we need a lot more tutoring in how to administer medications because we're being left out to dry. The rheumatologists don't want any part of us. If, if this is a first presenting symptom of rheumatoid arthritis, you're never going to get approved by an insurance company because you don't fit their, their, their score grades, their, their DAS 28 or 44. Yeah, it seems like a natural fit for the oral medicine um you know, subspecialty. Yeah, that, that were just my thoughts. Um, but you, you know what? There's nothing wrong with being a wet finger dentist. You, you don't have to do everything in your life. You just have to make yourself and your family happy. I, I, I think that's important to recognize too. That's a good, good will say. All right. I know we best very lightly touched on the next subject. Uh, but uh, a minute ago, you, you completely went off in a different direction on me when you said you really don't care about the, um, the, the, the dynamics and the movements in the jaw joint. But we did talk about this uh, previously uh, um, last week uh, about the, uh, the rotation translation concepts in the jaw joint. Um, tell us uh, from your point of view, what, what are the sequence of events there? What, what happens in there? What, what do I actually think happens? Yeah. When, when, uh, first off, I think, I think you're looking at a heterogeneous group of movements. I don't think everybody's the same, and I think there is enough inflammatory change. Even if those inflammatory changes have resolved, there are plenty of people in the population that have a displaced disc that are doing very well with what they have, but their kinematics are going to be a little bit different than somebody who's normal, and certainly their kinematics is going to be different than somebody who has active inflammation. But if you took a person who is really normal, if you could have your dream, okay. But is that really normal? Because this honestly is how every single normal patient that I try to make a research on is not normal. Well, I mean, it's yeah, a kid, let's try my daughter. Is you know, is uh, everybody. I, I think that what we're looking at in terms, of, and I've spent a lot of time studying the architecture of motion. When you take a look at it, I think that if you talk about rotation, you have to talk about it being down further on the mandible. So I know you think it's closer to C2, Javier, but actually when you take a look at the article I sent you by Claire Terhune, and she looks at movements, she's down pretty close to where you're talking about. So I think there's a center of rotation of the mandible. Now it's interesting because if you look at Purcell's envelope of motion, what you recognize is that something happens. Even though it's actually recording the lower incisor, simultaneously it's recording the condyle. So when you go to close, the motion is like a rocking chair. And this is my condyle. And probably from what's reported in the literature, I can't validate this. Certainly the temporalis, they're claiming it's the posterior temporalis, I believe, is pulling on this at the end. So what, what you end up doing is you're hitting first, if you were to check, and this is where CO comes in, CRCO, okay? You're likely to be hitting first on your second molar, and then you will have a motion that's a combination motion, which is gliding and rotatory down at the bottom, okay? So there, there has to be, as soon as there's an arcuate motion, there has to be rotation. It's a matter of what you're saying is being rotated 
that's really the issue. But, but my point is this, is that if you're doing a rocking chair motion in this condyle, when you're in full closure at MIP, is actually coming down, it's being distracted. It's the only place where the joint is actually being relatively unloaded. Other than that, you're on a path, okay? You're in a border pathway position described in Purcell's envelope of function. So if you have a normal condyle disc assembly, that's what's likely to happen, but you will still come down even if you don't. So it explains the role. It's like of the pivot, the, the, the description of the pivot is not, and that's what we're trying to talk, is the pivot of the joint is not necessarily happening here. When we see that's the correct. arches and the traces, you will see that that is a tangent, it's a part of a circle. And then if you just try, try to locate a circle that follow that diameter of that arch, you will see that the position never go up never go to the superior part where the condyle is located. That's correct. It doesn't it do goes that. Back. That's in, so then actually, what we say, actually, 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 actually it, it, it really does and doesn't go back. Let me explain to you why. I want you to watch my thumb, Javier, because if you take a look at it, it's coming forward and going back. When we take an ear bow back here, as opposed to spinning an axis, that this would be, okay, you know, the outside point of the condyle to try and find a center of rotation there. You're actually looking at a complex movement, okay? Take a look at it. So you see it going back on the ear bow, but in actuality, you're seeing that part of this is moving back while the rocking chair is actually moving forward. So that's what should be happening kinematically in, in the average person, but class one, two, and three don't have exactly the same movements. The other thing that I think it's really important to say here is this. If you're looking at what the joints do, the joints are the stabilizers of movement. We were taught, Hamid, give me the thumbs up on this, that it is the condyle that is the posterior determinant of occlusion. No, it is the second molar, if you have them, that is the posterior determinant of occlusion. The condyles are for movement. The molars are for when you hit your teeth together. That is correct. That's, that's the way we look at it anyway. Um, because well, we're in the I same remember from the back in, in early when I started, uh, a lot of the TMJ um, joint uh, treatments, I, I had an oral surgeon next to me, um, and, and they used to just do condylectomy. Yeah. You know, people in pain, they would just go and do condylectomy and that was CMJ treatment from a surgical standpoint. And these people would end up some without any symptoms and, and they could chew and function. So, uh, early on I realized that, oh, okay, we don't really need the joint condyles for the cl closing and, and, and function so much. It, it was the movement that was erratic. Uh, well, and, 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 and you know something, this is the whole point of, you know, of taking a systemic condition because it protects the patient in a certain way that they still may end up with an aggressive procedure. I don't deny that. Um, but I don't think it can be managed by any stretch of the imagination reliably with conservative care. Um, certainly conservative care, in my opinion, is likely to make them worse. And I have cases that started out where you wouldn't necessarily know that a systemic condition was underlying this patient. They don't often evolve quick enough so you could see it in blood. It's a real problem. But I, I mean, if you take a look online at, at, at you know, uh, I have a video on splints and treatment. I took a case that was a failure, that the bite opened up, in my opinion, and the patient had idiopathic thrombocytopenia purpura, dairy platelets, okay? You know, so, you know, that kind of stuff is important to pick up if you can. Hopefully, I'll get to be able to do a clinical course. I think even writing this is hard for people to understand. Um, I think you need it's to It is hard, but it's fascinating, honestly. It's good yeah. sometimes to feel your weakness and see, uh, well, you know, what you need to reinforce. 
And yeah, yeah. I think it, this, that it, really it, important. It, it's even tough for me to keep my head glued on. I got to tell you something. This is like walking through a Salvador Dali painting, you know, when I do this stuff. Is there anything else I can add to this before you uh, terminate me? No, we just feel sorry <laughs> for your wife because if you... <laughs> <laughs> because um, I put a lot of with my wife. What a horrible uh, thing to say to our guest. <laughs> well, you know something? I'm going to pay you the biggest compliment. First of all, you have a gorgeous wife, Harriet, Javier. Thank you so and much. And how much you, you and she and your family mean to you. But if you've learned nothing from your marital relationship, <laughs> I married Miss Wright, and her first name is Always. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm still the head of the house, but the, the, she's the neck. So she did oh, change no, no, the no, direction. No. She can have the pants. She's the head of the house. It, it makes everybody's life easier here. No, but it's amazing to have people fascinated as you are. And on, honestly, I know how hard that is for our families because, like, uh, I don't know for you guys, but uh, my wife and I, we, she, like I do, look at her. She's with earphones. She's watching every single interview. She's fascinated for the perspective. We talk about dentistry every day, all day, always related in life because it's the lifestyle that we get. So we know how tough we are with our families, with our own beliefs and dreams and and motivation. So right. I want to give it just 10 points to all our families that support the craziness. And you know, j just, just so the other guests know, in my video presentation, and I still need a time for that, uh, Javier, I'm going to show you how I start from the beginning in four sector diagnosis. I'm going to go through some of the stuff that I can do reasonably in, in 30 minutes and show them how the results turned out in the MRIs, because to get those pairings, if you don't have an answer in the blood, you can't bring it back to the MRI and confirm that you actually have one, two, three, four diseases. And you're going to see cases with three and four diseases all in the same person. Wow. This is fascinating. Incredible. Awesome. You're so great. Uh, again, we passed it again. I mean, today we extend it again. I know. We did it quite a bit, actually. I think, actually, we made one hour more. We made two hours. This is the first Almost one. Two hours. You're an hour 45. An, an hour, hour 45. 45. But that this, is beautiful because we made over. I can't thank you enough for your hospitality, all the hard work that you're putting in. You guys are really terrific. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Larry. I appreciate you uh, uh, giving us some of some a little bit. I know it was barely touching the surface of your knowledge. Uh, and, and really opening our eyes to a whole new uh, portal to look at our, uh, our problems through. And, uh, and, and that, that's admirable for all, you know, all this time and energy you've put into reading and, and really uh, understanding all these other issues. It, 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 it's my pleasure. I hope I gave everybody something at least to think about because giving somebody something worthwhile here is, is tough in this format. It, we it, always it, need a Larry close by us. So, Everybody and you know, Larry, don't, you, don't overwhelm my Larry, okay? <laughs> <laughs> don't okay, you know, Larry, don't take mine. No, this is fascinating, honestly. And uh, Again, Larry, I love you for the support that you gave me conditionally with all the literature. For my lectures and the research, you're amazing. Okay, yes, guys. So so. Just don't invite me to the beach in Miami. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, we need to spend time together when this is over. You okay, guys. Enjoy. Thank you so much. Uh...